Here we go. I think we're going live. Yeah, it says live on Facebook. We're streaming live. We're live. So, uh, hello, the Florida Wrestling Room. Uh, how are you again today? And um, we're lucky enough to uh, have Julian Ramirez and Yanni D on the phone. I'm not going to attempt the last name because I'll embarrass myself. And uh, we've got Ricky here, my partner in crime. And uh, hey, guys, I know uh, even though we're quarantined, I'm sure you guys are still busy with your practicing and keeping yourselves in shape. And um, I really appreciate you guys coming on. So uh, go ahead and talk a little bit about what you're doing, what you're doing to stay in shape, and how this has affected your world right now. Um, so we actually got uh, quarantined early, like with all the universities. And as soon as that happened, um, Everything happened so fast. I mean, one day to the next, I was in Yanni's car and we headed up to Rochester. So uh, we spent the last month up at his house. So training wasn't really that big of a deal. It didn't affect us that often because we we had wrestling mats in his garage and we were quarantined, just me and him and his father. And it was that's kind of how it worked out for us. We came back like last week, back to Ithaca. Yeah, I mean, you know, same deal. I pretty much got a call from uh, Mike Gray telling me that uh, they're going to close the Freedman. They're closing down campus for, for all the COVID stuff. So, you know, pretty much took me two minutes to figure out what I was doing. I decided to get someone to come home with me. I asked Julian. He was cool with it. So brought him back to Rochester. And him and I, you know, we just stayed isolated and we wrestled that way. And, um, you know, obviously I was with my family and stuff. We were there for a while, you know, and then and my dad decided, you know, my coaches included and myself – that I was going to take some time off. So we came back to Ithaca, you know, kind of back where, you know, that's where we both live most of the time. So spending time in Ithaca right now, just, you know, doing small stuff, some light lifts and going on runs and something, you know, a little less crazy, but staying in shape and making it work. Yeah. If Kyle asked me to wrestle, I'll head over to his house. And I actually do like functional patterns. So, which is all in Kyle's realm. So I'm actually at his house every now and then. So. So for those that don't know what functional patterns is, what is that? Um, it's a different form of lifting. So like it's uh, they're trying to in, enforce like lifting through motion and using your body to like uh, work better, like and rather than just like hurting your muscles while lifting or like stretching too much and being too flaccid. They, it's like you're lifting and stretching at the same time. And it's hard to explain, but. If you search it up, functional patterns on YouTube, you could find a lot of information about yeah, it. it. Sounds cool. Sounds cool. Same thing um, is training your body through motion and just getting an entire complete range of motion. And it's all about the reason it's called functional patterns. It's because they believe your body operates in a certain way. So sometimes certain things you do that are lifting are counterproductive to how your body is meant to work. So the way that they strength train is they put you through these, they're kind of strange motions where they put you through these motions that are the proper form of movement and develops your body to move that certain way and you build strength in those types of movements. Because all your all your muscles are connected. So if you're just like isolating one muscle and working out your bicep, you're not necessarily you're getting your bicep stronger, but it's not like working with your the rest of your muscles. Gotcha. So what you're trying to do is trying to get the muscles to work with your fingertips, through your bicep, through your chest, like all the different spirals where they connect. So it's like interesting. There's a whole science to it and everything. Of course, it's the Ivy League guys that, that are doing that, right? <laughs> Kyle, kind of, Kyle kind of found it and embraced it when, with all his injury, and he really believes in it, and that's everything he, he talks about nowadays. So, Oh, look, man, yeah. if he's doing it, it, it can't be too bad. So it's probably a good idea. Um, Dan, I got a few questions that have been texted to me, but you let me know what, what you want to do. I've got a couple questions that my son had sent me because he had did a report yeah. so he wanted to ask. But um, just in case anybody in the wrestling room is not familiar with these two, um, obviously Yanni D, a four-time New York State champ out of Hilton High School, two-time cadet world champ, two-time NCAA champ, a U.S. Open and a Pan Am champ. I could have made a book report about all the other stuff he has, but that's kind of the big stuff there. And then uh, Julian, not too shabby himself, two-time Florida State champ, two-time national prep champ, multiple world team placer, uh, competed at who's number one twice, cadet runner-up, and cadet All-American. So you've got two uh, huge, well-known wrestlers in the wrestling community right here talking with you guys. 
Um, before we, I know that my, my son wanted me to ask you these questions, so he sent me some stuff. Do you want me to ask them, ask him the questions first, and then I'll let you go? And yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so uh, for Yanni, sorry, Julian, he, he wrote them for Yanni, I apologize. <laughs> uh, he said, when did you realize you had torn your ACL at the 2018 NCAA? So if you go back and watch it, about a minute in, we get in a scramble and the ref stops it, potentially dangerous, which is funny because he missed it by like a second. But I go rubber knee to like slide my knee out and start running behind him. And what happened was as I started sliding out, I tried to cut the corner around him at the same time and I cut it too quickly and Kyle kept my ankle and kept his head pressed on my knee and just, I pretty much tore my own ACL. I jumped. And my knee was locked in, so it just turned, but the rest of my leg didn't move, so I just tore it like that. I remember getting up and walking back to the middle, and the first step I took, my knee slid, and I was like, oh, never. <laughs> <laughs> that ain't right. I that before. And, uh, you know, I almost like thought about taking injury time and then ended up, you know, not doing it, wrestling out the rest of the match. And, you know, and the rest of the tournament. <laughs> oh, so next one. If anybody watches your matches – they know right away you have a very funky style. When did you realize that this would be the way you would wrestle? You know, I feel like it's, it, it's, uh, it's organic because I always thought of myself as, you know, kind of a guy who attacked, you know, when I was younger. Or not even, I guess we spend a lot of time myself working on my offense. And what happens is I think sometimes, you know, at least what I've learned about myself is I get too offensively minded and guys just dive in at my legs. I'm, I'm not even – you know, I'm, I'm working on it, but sometimes I'm not even aware of it. So then guys end up on my legs a lot because I'm constantly pursuing them. And that's kind of how all of these scrambles started. And then just kind of by practice and by, by intrigue of the sport, I learned all these, you know, scrambling techniques and figured out all these different ways that I can put guys in danger. And uh, it kind of happened organically. You know, there's never a time where I just decided I was going to be a scrambling guy. Like I remember going back and watching home videos from when I was, you know, 10 or 11 and being like, man, I didn't realize how much rolling around I did when I was a kid. You know what I mean? It's like, you don't even realize you're doing it. It just kind of happens. All right. I just have three more, Ricky. I, I apologize. No, go, go. Um, what helped push your decision to Cornell? And this probably could be a question for both of you. Yeah. I mean, for me, it was a, it was a big school thing. You know, I, I, uh, I always had goals in wrestling. That was not that that was my first priority, but that was something that I always wanted. But I wanted to go somewhere that I knew, even if, you know, the wrestling didn't work out or I got hurt, I still had, I still had options. You know I mean? It wasn't that I was like, it wasn't like I would be stuck at some, you know, lower end school that maybe they had great wrestling, but, you know, I couldn't get the best degree that I could have got. You know, I, I was a smart kid. I did well in high school. So I thought I should go somewhere where I could take advantage of that if I ever decided, you know, wrestling wasn't going to be a part of my future. So for me, it was much of the same thing. Um, I looked into it when I was younger and I first started wrestling. So I was like, all right, Cornell has a really good wrestling program and education. So I always kind of had the like dream of going there and like Kyle Dake was around that time. And I also like, I don't know, once the recruiting process started, I mean, Yanni was a good friend of mine since middle school. So when I spoke to him about it, he was just like, yeah, man, I'm at Cornell. And after going to his house and starting to go to the school and everything, I, couldn't imagine not going to school with one him and let alone like the whole program in itself speaks for itself. So. Absolutely. Um, Yanni, how would you describe your high school career? Um, you know, I mean, I had a, I had a successful high school career. There were some things that I could have achieved that I failed on, but I feel that if someone thought that they didn't have any failures, then maybe they didn't put themselves out there enough. You know what I mean? It's high school wrestling. So I had some failures. I had some shortcomings. I had a lot of, uh, I had a lot of success too, though. And um, I think at that, you know, every time I had, I had a loss or I had something not go my way indirectly, I, I needed it. You know, I always thought that the most growth I ever had came after I lost matches. So, you know, I, uh, I didn't lose a lot, but when I did, you know, I got a lot from it. So I guess that's good. And then the, the last one that he had, and, and we'll go back to you, Julian, um, to describe your high school career, and then we'll get into Ricky. Uh, but just to get these out of the way so we can push forward, uh, what 
What do you have to tell all the kids who want to be like Yanni and wrestle with your style and try to emulate your style? And, and that's the last one I have. Yeah, so if you're going to be a guy and, you know, you want to add scrambling as something as part of you do, it, it, it can't be – it can't be all you have. You know, I mean, you need to have good offense. You need to have good positioning. And, you know, it's it's stuff that works. You know, don't get me wrong. But, you know, at the highest level, you know, it's all about, you know, the most simplest things and that you do it perfectly. So, you know, there's like the Bruce Lee quote, you don't fear a man who's practiced a thousand kicks one time. You fear the man who's practiced one kick a thousand times. So if it's – if you want to be some – if you want scrambling to be something that you do, you need to make sure it's not all you can do. You need to be – you know, you need to have the basic fundamentals. You need to be perfect at them, and then on top of that, you can build scrambling. You know what I mean? Because if you don't have, if you don't have really good and really strong basic skill, everything that you build off it will be flawed. You need that strong foundation. Awesome, thanks. And um, Julian, go ahead and talk about your high school career, and then uh, Ricky, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Um, you know, the transition. You had a great, I mean, an all-world coach in Florida for the two state championships you had here. And then of course, Blair speaks for itself. So talk about your transition, uh, the difference and uh, how it was for you. Yeah, um, you know, growing up in Florida and growing up in Miami, I've had plenty of great coaches. I mean, my uh, originally you've had Coach Duck on here. Coach Duck and uh, Bama Seda were two of my first coaches because uh, I was originally thinking of South Dade and I went to Gladiator Law and I was always around their guys. Then I went to, so I was at Belen Jesuit and I had a, a good coach on there. And then I went to Tampa Jesuit for a year. Um, I loved Sa uh, Sal Basil and uh, the rest of the staff as well. I mean, I had Frere, the luck of Frere as well. So I was always training with them. And um, the transition was pretty easy for me. I'd say I, uh, Sher I mean, there was Sherman, Moscow and Singletary, uh, a few Florida natives who were at Blair. And uh, that's kind of what got me over there. So once I was talking to them, I went to check it out and I fell in love with the school and what the program had to offer. And I think that was gonna really change my wrestling. And I won two Florida State titles. So originally I had planned to win five Florida State titles. And, um, you know, I never got to do that, but I think I exceeded some of my expectations and how it ended up doing in high school, so. No, you yeah. definitely, if you would have stayed, you definitely would have been one of the uh, few five timers that we have. There's no doubt in my mind about that. And hopefully in the future, Ricky, we can keep kids like that as the sport grows. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, thank you so much for answering my questions. I appreciate you guys coming on with us. And, um, and then just my kid, he's been running around calling his wrestling coach, his wrestling friends. He's, I can hear him saying, guess who I just talked to? So he's stoked. So that made my whole world. So thank you guys. No All right. So um, this this question is going to be for both of you. Uh, this was texted to me um, and it's a great question. And I would love to know the answer to this as well as everybody out there. Will. we got like nine thousand members. So a lot of people are going to hear your answer here. And this is for both of you. Um, you both have amazing discipline. I mean, that's obvious. The sacrifices you make, the training that you do. The question is, what drives your passion? What drives your passion for doing all that? What drives your passion for the sport of wrestling? Julian, you want to go first or me? Uh, you go first. Okay. So for me, you know, I, uh, I, I started the sport when I was really young. It's been kind of a part of my life. And, you know, as I've gotten older, one thing that, you know, I talk with my dad a lot and I talk to my coach about a lot is that, uh, you know, it's, it's something at this point that it's, it's part of, you know, my identity. You know, I mean, it's, I don't, I don't have to live and die by it, but it's, it's how I, I recognize myself, you know what I mean? So I, I take a lot of pride in it and it doesn't necessarily have to be result driven, but it has to be, it's intrinsic, you know what I mean? So I want to be great and I want to, you know, I want to do these great things, but a lot of this is just based on, you know, my internal desire to just be great at what I do. You know what I mean? Even just from a greater lens than wrestling, people want to be great at what they do. Sure. You know? I mean, it's wrestling, you know, for other people, it's other stuff. So it's just kind of been a, it's something that's been a part of my life for so long that, you know, it's kind of just the goal is to be, to master it. Um, 
I think for me, it's kind of morphed into a lot of like what he just said uh, as I got older. But um, originally growing up, I had a pretty, you know, I wouldn't say it was a bad upbringing, but it was a rough upbringing. You know, a lot of things happened in my life. My my home was split and everything. And uh, wrestling was kind of my escape. And I just enjoyed the the grind of it and being having something to like look forward to every day and go to practice every day. And that drive just turned into like, now as I got older, my junior, senior year in high school, it just became like, realistically, wrestling's all I know. I, I can create conversation through wrestling yeah. all long. <laughs> I mean, me and Yanni spent, when I was at his house, it was, wrestling was pretty much all day. Whether it was watching it, talking about it, talking about old matches, hypothetical matches, talking about the virtual NCAs. I mean, like, there's not much that we that we know besides this sport. So I'd say it's just like, it's part of our whole identity. So I agree with him on that. Awesome answers, guys. Um, the other question was, um, do you guys ever think about the things that you missed because of your sacrifices? Obviously, you guys weren't the normal high school athlete. I mean, you were at such a higher level. You guys, obviously, you sacrificed a lot. I mean, I'm sure you sacrificed parties. You sacrificed girlfriends. You sacrificed – there's a lot of sacrifices to get to the levels that you guys were at. Obviously, the payoff was great because you're at Cornell, but do you guys ever think about – the sacrifices or uh, I'm sorry, the um, what you missed because of your sacrifices or that doesn't even really matter to you. Um, I'll take this one. So for me, I would say, yes, I do think about it a lot, but um, a lot of times that's usually when I'm not, when I'm rest, that's usually when I'm wrestling less. Like when I feel like I'm wrestling less, I'm like, Oh man, like I could have been doing so much. Like, like for example, right now during quarantine, I'm like, man, all my life, like I could have had all this other stuff happening, but whenever I'm in season, like everything kind of goes away. I don't usually think about that stuff. Cause it's like, I'm enjoying what I'm doing in the moment. Yeah. I feel like it's just like when I'm away from it more, it's like, but there's the other side of it. The more I'm away from the sport, the more I'm itching to get back on the mat. And I'm like, I can't like every time I'm injured, there's no way I'm on off the mat for like, or out of the wrestling room for longer than a week. That's there's that's impossible. <laughs> Not gonna happen. I mean, you could go on to that. Yeah, I mean, sacrifice is an interesting thing that gets thrown around in our sport. You know, everyone has to sacrifice and give stuff up, but you know, you got to think about it differently because if you look at it as sacrifice, the sport becomes a chore. You know, I mean, you it shouldn't feel. Like, I get it because it's the same stuff I've heard growing up my whole life is that I've been missing out on stuff. You know, I mean, I, I missed out. I missed out on a lot of things that people think are really important, you know, for growing up. And it's not it's it's a choice. You know, what I mean, and you can't you can't feel remorse for it because it's it's why you're good. You know, what I mean, if you want to if you want to feel bad about missing out on stuff, then you can't feel bad when you lose. That's you know? a good point. It's a very it's, good point. That's not what I'm talking about, you know, like being it with it being intrinsic. It's like, uh, you know, my dad said this to me one time. We he, we talked deeply a lot. He was saying how things shouldn't be considered sacrifice if you're giving them up for something you care about. You know what I mean? Because it's it's just the cost. You know, what I mean, nothing great is comes without cost. Mm -hmm. So if I want to be great at wrestling, I don't get to just be great at wrestling and and in return, I do everything exactly as an average person would. If you want to be great, you can't behave averagely. You have to behave greatly. You know? Right. So, like, yeah, I'm, I'm. You miss out on stuff, and when you're a kid, you're like, man, that sucks. You know, I didn't get to do this, this, and this. But you understand when you get older. You know, you can't, you can't, you can't have everything. You can't be great at things and and live as if you want to be average at everything. You know, right. yeah, so I feel yeah. like that that started to go away like the last few years as well that like oh I wish I was a kid because I mean like in college like you kind of experience both worlds but at the same time there's a balance so like you get to like experience that balance and like learn to not care about going out and partying and stuff so yeah at some point you gotta live with your decision you know I mean you gotta you gotta know what you're signing up for yeah, and I guess, you know, when, when you're standing in the middle of that, Matt, Yanni, and your hand's getting raised for the NCAA title, all that goes away. 
yeah, I mean, that's what, that's what it's for. You know, you're not, that's kind of what I'm talking about. It's like, you don't, you don't get to just do everything. You know I mean? You have to understand that it's a maturity thing. You know, you can't, you don't get to succeed at the highest level and do all the things that would stop you from doing such. You know? Right. Exactly. Yeah. All right. This next question. I love this question. I, I can't wait to hear the answers. And this is again for both of you. How important is it to you guys to surround yourself with greatness? Uh, I'll start with that one. Cause um, I mean, he's part of the reason I chose coming here. Uh, obviously like his su success speaks for itself, but um, you know, he is a great role model. He is a, a great person. And, you know, I spent time with his family, being able to be around his family. I got to understand like what he's like and, my mom always said that, like, if you hang around the right people, like, you're going to start just performing better in your sport. And so I've always, like, made sure, you know, I've hung out around the right people. And, you know, one of my best friends is up here, so that's another thing. And Kyle, Kyle is one of my biggest role models. So, like, I, I think it's a very important thing in, like, your success. So, I mean, it's part of the reason I went to Blair as well. Yeah, I mean uh – it creates a standard, you know, I mean, if you, if you spend time around high achieving people, your perception of normal becomes high achieving. So if you're in a room with a bunch of guys who skip practice and their goal is to qualify for the state tournament before they graduate college, then that eventually will become your standard just because of the environment. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It takes a really strong force to create a standard separate from your environment, but if yeah. your environmental standard is to be, great. Let's take wrestling out of it. Call it whatever you want. If you're on the football team and your environmental standard was to create a state champion team, then that's what you start to expect. And anything below that level of performance becomes below average. So I think surrounding yourself with high achieving people is important because it, it creates, it creates that culture of high achieving. Absolutely. So obviously we just heard Julian, you know, refer to you that, you know, you are, you are one of his role models. Um, Yanni, who was, who was that greatness that you looked up to? You know, I looked up to, to Kyle a lot, Kyle Dake, you know, he was someone who grew up kind of in my air, like in my, I grew up in his era and right. still going, but his college wrestling era, you know, and he, uh, he was really good. You know what I mean? And he, he won tough matches, you know, he's a tough, you could see he was a tough guy he was gritty you know and he he was willing to kind of stick his face in there and just take a lot of take a lot for, for success you know and I, I looked up to John Smith a lot you know we were talking about it before I got on he was the first guy who I ever like watched like met yeah. and I was like whoa um but I watched a lot of him growing up you know and he's uh you know especially before Jordan Burroughs started wrestling he was undoubtedly the best American wrestler of all time mm -hmm. so you know, I, he, I always looked up to him. I always wanted to be able to replicate, you know, what he did at some point. You know, he did the, the six in a row thing is insane. He just came in, <laughs> won a bunch of times, stepped out, and became this amazing coach, you know. So kind of talking about a, a more recent guy and an older guy who I looked up to, you know, those were the kind of guys who you know, I wanted to emulate after. How is Kyle as a coach compared to how great he was as a wrestler? Is he just as good of a coach? Amazing technician, I think. Yeah, he's really good at kind of catering to you. You know, I mean, Kyle doesn't exactly have a style, you know, that's as clear and straightforward as, you know, other guys, but he does a really good job of, you know, the stuff that he might introduce to one guy. So there could be a position, a small front head block. And we have a heavyweight and we have, you know, even me is like the, probably the lightest guy or Chas Tucker is the lightest guy who Kyle spends a lot of time working with. And it, they both can be working from front head block and Kyle can teach, you know, our heavyweight firm in one thing. And Chaz, another thing, for no other reason than he just understands the body types. He understands the skill level, you know, yeah. the skills that each guy possesses. And I think that's a, that's a good skill to have as a coach. You know, I mean, he, to be adaptable, to be able to, you know, create, develop an individual style instead of creating a team style. You know, I think that's valuable. Yeah. So we kind of touched on it earlier with both of you guys of why Cornell. Um, and this is again for both of you. Um, if it wasn't Cornell, who was in the running? Who were the who were the top schools that were right behind Cornell for you guys? <laughs> I mean, like, there's, I don't know. There's a difference between like where I would have loved to go and then what was in the running. You know. Okay, I mean? so where would you have loved to go? 
I, I grew up loving Oak Key State and Cornell. So okay. My favorite, which is, yeah, I'm pretty sure Yanni has the same. <laughs> We've talked about this before. Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I expected to go to Cornell kind of my whole, as soon as I was thinking about schools, but mm -hmm. I, I had, I had kind of backup plans and, you know, fortunately I didn't ever have to use any of them, <laughs> but, um, you know, I, uh, there, there was, there was a lot of schools, you know, that reached out and that I was interested in stuff, but, you know, it had always been. Yeah. So you're not going to answer it. <laughs> I mean, I looked up to J.O. and Kyle growing up. So, like, for me, it was – that's kind of why I had those two in mind. Yeah, but, was another one. I used to love Jordan Oliver when I was in high school. <laughs> Jordan's the man. He's, Jordan. He's still the man. Jordan being like, wow, that dude is good. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, I want to get that wrestling now. <laughs> I think yeah. Tech was realistically like my number two. Is uh, that because of Frere? Yeah, a lot of it had to do with that. Okay. Mm. All right, so Yanni's not going to answer, so I'm going to move on to the next one. Um, all right, Yanni, who was your toughest match to date in college? College. <laughs> I mean, I, I lost that match to Ironman, but I was winning – for most of it. So I'm going to go ahead and say the Joey McKenna match in the NCAA finals. Like, I don't know. You guys know what I'm talking about. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, he, uh, they had a really, really good game plan for me and, you know, and Joey did a good job kind of keeping, keeping off, you know, not, not letting me really engage with him. And, uh, they, they had a really good game plan and it, it worked for most of the, <laughs> for most of the match, you know, there was pretty much two situations in regulation that I could have scored from. And one of them, we challenged and I didn't get it. And the other one I scored from. So he did a good job kind of limiting my opportunities and, you know, Kate, like wrestling the way he would have liked the match to play out. So that was definitely a really tough one. Are you talking about like the two times I kind of like stepped over the wizard? And like yeah, him? one time where I put him on his back and then the other time where I put the leg in and that was the one that they called. You see? He follows you. <laughs> <laughs> so the Ironman, the Ironman loss, was that at the uh, South Beach Duels in Florida? Yeah, I was right in Florida. I was, I was there. That's when I first met you, actually. And I got to tell you something, man. I, that's when I became like the biggest Yanni Diakam Hollis fan. And it wasn't because of anything wrestling related. I got to tell you what it was. You know, after you lost that match, the way you handled that loss, it, it was it was beautiful, man. Like you weren't like, at least you didn't show it. You, you weren't pissed. You didn't storm off. You didn't chuck your headgear. You were like the perfect gentleman. You were actually talking to the guy after the match over by the little bleachers. I was very, very impressed with, with just the whole way you handled it. It was a great thing to see. I, I even showed my son. I said, that's the way, you, that's the way you got to be. That's class right there. So I, I just wanted to throw that out to you and, and tell you that um, I was really impressed with that, but I'm sure you were pissed you wouldn't want to lose that match but yeah i mean well there's a difference between what you let people see and what you don't you of know? course of course you can't you can't be the guy who makes a scene every time you some guys that. can't control that some guys you know as hard as they try they still you know yeah it's it's a temper thing, you know? yeah and uh you know trust me that one hurt i was not happy about that but there's a difference between showing the world and making a big scene throwing a fit and having security drag you out versus of course <laughs> well you know what you got the last laugh because you went on to win an ncaa title yeah we'll take we'll, take, we'll, we'll trade for it for the other one so. absolutely all right and then the next question linked to that is um who would you say your toughest international match is Lusakaya, for sure he uh he was one so we get i'm down nine to one we get in the scramble and i'm kind of holding around his waist reverse and he's inches from scooting over my foot and taking me down to tech ball me and then that was in the middle of a scramble another kind of second scramble ensues off of that position and then i end up taking him down in that one making it nine three and then coming all the way back and winning but you know he was he was lightning fast really really explosive you know he i can't imagine guys really beating him if he wasn't in like phenomenals if he was a, if he was in good shape you know He's yeah, not yeah. in very good shape, you know, as you can kind of tell. If he was, he'd be really hard to beat, you know. So lucky for me, he's not, he's not in great shape. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that was a good – that was a really tough match. And it kind of showed me how far off I was, you know, how much better I needed to get. But yeah, kinda, absolutely. You know, in his run at the Worlds, he's 
really, really good, but you know, he's struggled with conditioning sometimes. He's just such a such an explosive wrestler and such a skilled guy that he's still got a medal anyway. With yeah, him. exactly. That says a lot. All right, Julian, I have a question. This is gonna be for both of you. I'm gonna ask Julian first. Um, when all is said and done and the wrestling is over, what is it that you would have liked to accomplish? What well, we um we have something that we kind of instill is along the team is like just try and be like better than yesterday and like trying to be the best self. And um I don't know, I don't really want to like ha- set like a specific goal for myself, but I've always wanted to be an Olympic champ. That is something that's always been on my goal. I mean, it's the whole reason why I started wrestling. And then as far as NCAA titles are concerned, as many as I can receive, then that is the goal. Like it's gonna it's four right now. If it doesn't happen next year, it's three. So that's pretty much how that's going to work out. And, and what's your projected weight? 65? Yeah, I think so. Right. Either that or 50, maybe 57. That's, that's what? You might be getting bigger than an 84 pounder soon. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't even be a 74. Nah, if, nah, 50, nah. Yeah, I know. But 57 he, or 65. He is not. looking pretty bulky. <laughs> <laughs> I get down to as low as like 63 sometimes. You're getting light sometimes. Yeah, walking around like my I fluctuate like crazy. So it all depends. All right. So I just received the text and you guys are going to have to guess who sent me this text. It says, tell Yanni that you heard his driving skills suck. Oh, that could be a lot of <laughs> my mom. <laughs> You're right, Julian. <laughs> and wait, she says, she says, tell Julian his does too. So maybe Bo should practice on their driving. <laughs> she hasn't been in a car with me for so long. It was back to like, you were done. It was, no, it was like a few months ago. <laughs> when she right, it was after the dessert. <laughs> what's, what's, up with, what's up with the driving? You guys are not good drivers or what? No, I used to be. I'm fine now. I used to be terrible. <laughs> so the other day she was like, the roads are pretty bad in Ithaca, and I drive this big clunky, not clunky, I drive this big Jeep, and the wheels are, the shreds on them are really thick. Yeah, yeah. So when you drive, it kind of goes. I yeah, got to, yeah. yeah, I got to so, give him credit. Like, it does feel bad when you're driving with him in the Jeep because of Ithaca, and it's, like, not a very smooth car. So his mom's whole joke now is I'm, like, the worst driver ever. <laughs> I have a question since I still have my son here. Um what would you what would you tell him to focus on? He's so he's fourteen. He's young for ninth grade. He just had his first freshman year. Uh, what would you tell him to, the the big thing is to focus on while he's home, kind of um, quarantine because obviously we can't go to the wrestling room. Uh, what would you guys recommend he does at home? Um, Julian, you want to go over me first? Oh, you go first. Okay. So. I guess a big thing to focus on is you want to know at least what you're going to start working on when you get back. You know, you kind of want to have that short-term, long-term plan where, you know, the first month back, I want, like, think about it like this. So you're not wrestling right now. You might sit down and watch a bunch of matches, watch your own, watch other people and talk with your dad, talk with your coaches and be like, my first month back, you know, I want to start working on this. And then you might say six months from now, I want my wrestling to be like this. So, like, for me, I might sit there, you know, and think, not even just watch, just think about it. And I might say, you know, for the next month or so, I'm going to work on keeping guys off my legs. And then I might say, down the line, I want no one touching my legs, and I want to be able to go and attack guys completely. And that can be kind of how you talk about it. And they can be unrelated. They can be unrelated. It might be, right now, I'm going to work on my single legs, but, you know, in the future, I want to make sure that, I have great mat wrestling or whatever. You know what I mean? And this way you have constantly things that you can work on because it's, it's a lot of wasted time if you just sit around and do nothing and then come back to practice and you're like, all right, so what am I doing? You know what I mean? You might as well take this time to, to, to address what you're, what you're working on. Um, I think something you could do during quarantine, not during quarantine, that I feel like a lot of high school wrestlers especially miss out on is watching a lot of film. So like – 
uh, Yanni obviously watches a ton of film, but as me as well, I've always watched a bunch of Russians and different people from other countries. And, you know, I've watched like my favorite wrestlers a thousand times. Like I could tell you all about every single one of Jordan Oliver and Kyle Dick's matches because I've watched them all growing up and I've watched them all recently. Like at Yanni's house, we watch film all day. So it's like, I feel like film is something people miss out on a lot and you can actually learn a lot from the sport and like different ways of motion and just everything, whatever you want to work on, you know, you can just find somebody who's good at it and see how they wrestle. You know, I like, in class, I get in trouble for watching wrestling. I'm sorry? A lot of times in class, I get in trouble for watching wrestling. <laughs> I, that was me every day. <laughs> My coach, my coach is my math teacher. He'll shut down my iPad. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's it's a good thing. Definitely watch a lot of wrestling and just like use that to like kind of add on to what Yanni was talking about. Like whatever whatever position you want to work on, like find who's good at that position and do some research. We'll go from there, Ricky. You all right? Did we lose you? Ricky, is it your turn to be lost? <laughs> Ricky. Ricky? Hold on, someone's calling me right now. Well, you gotta hang up on them. I am, I am, I am. You can't pick <laughs> well, well, go ahead and keep talking then, because Ricky's on the phone. <laughs> so, um. Ask them about a match. Ask them about the NCAAs. Ask them about whatever you want to ask them. So how close did you feel like, what's the guy's name that you broke at the tournament? The Russian guy? Or I think you're talking about right? Kukulev. That you were like so close to getting teched and then you broke him. Yeah, I mean, I could, I could feel that he was getting tired, you know? And if you look at the match, like, yeah, I was down 9-0, but – it was, it was one big exchange that cost me a lot of points. So I, I kind of understood, you know, where I had to stay out of. He, he hit me with the same shot, you know, I think two or three times in a row. Where he was just hitting a leg and running through it. So I understood that he was getting tired and that I had to keep him, keep space between him and myself so he couldn't just run through me. So I made some adjustments and just kind of – What did you say? It looked like you were wearing him down already in, like, the first period. Yeah, yeah, he uh, he got tired pretty quickly. You know, I, I mean, he didn't hit empty, but I could feel him starting to slow down a little bit. All right, Dan. You back, Ricky? I am back, but I do have to get back to work because I was supposed to be back like 20 minutes ago. But I want to fire off the 10 questions before I go, and then if you guys want to continue, if they can, you can. But I'm going to fire off the 10 questions for, uh, for both of them. We'll, obviously, we'll have to go one at a time. So, Yanni, I'm going to hit you with 10 questions. They're going to be one-word answers. Let me know when you're ready. Ready. All right. Folk style or freestyle? Freestyle. Headgear or no headgear? No headgear. Singlet or two-piece? I like the singlet, but I think two-piece is better for this sport. Coke or Pepsi? Coke. Ice cream cake or birthday cake? Birthday cake. Salt water or fresh water? Fresh water. Rap or country? Rap. <laughs> car or pickup truck? Jeep. Uh, yeah, car. <laughs> All right. Popeyes or Chick Fil A? Chick Fil A. Everybody says it. And ocean uh, or swimming pool? Ocean. All right. You ready, Julian? Yeah kind of cheated because you got to listen to him first i might hit you with some different I, ones i honestly don't even remember them okay <laughs> all right ocean or swimming pool uh swimming pool popeyes or chick-fil-a chick-fil-a folk style or freestyle freestyle headgear or no headgear no headgear tom brands or kale sanderson <laughs> tom brands <laughs> <laughs> ice cream cake or birthday cake uh ice cream cake Rap or country? Rap. Car or pickup truck? Car. <laughs> this, ain't, this isn't even fair. Blair or Jesuit? You don't have to answer. You don't have to answer. Uh. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. All right, man. Thank you guys. I wasn't going to try. I was like, damn. <laughs> <laughs> I was just messing with you on that. Dan made me go against. He goes, Nick or Bryce. I'm like, how are you going to ask me that, Nick or Bryce? They're both my oh, that's easy, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> 
Nick said, Nick said, Dad, oh, your price is the golden child at your house. Thank like, you. That's See, that's he, he even knows. Nick said he's a golden child. He goes, Nick goes, here we go. This is water. This is Bryce. <laughs> Very true. All right. So, guys, I'm out of here. Yanni, thank you so much. We really appreciate you coming here on the Florida Wrestling Room, taking time out of your day. We know that you train and, and it's busy and, and your time is very important to you. So we do thank you. Julian, thank you so much for being on. Thank you for getting Yanni. And uh, we would love to have you guys back very soon. Yeah. No problem, of course. Uh, are you getting off, Ricky? Yeah, I do. I got to get back to work. All right. I'll, I'll just... Um... I'll end it here with them in just a minute. I know Daniel probably wants to say goodbye to them. And, awesome. Uh, all, jump off too. all right. Take care, guys. Love you, Julian. Take care. Love you, man. Bye. Hey, so thank you guys for coming on. I just, uh, I mean, we, went, we could probably talk for hours, right? The room is awesome. But I know you guys got to get to work. But uh, did you, was there anything you wanted to talk about before we go? No, thanks, Yanni. Thanks, Julian. No yeah. problem, man. It was good talking to you. Yeah. Thanks for having us on. It was a good time. So um, I guess I'll, I'll just, uh, I, I've got your cell phone numbers now, so I'll just bother you all day long. No, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But uh, I, do, uh, I do appreciate it. And for, for all the young men out there to see guys like you really being successful in Ivy League schools, um, this is why uh, we preach uh, the wrestling and what it does to children out there and what it does to kids and, and what you guys become. And we really need to get the word spread so that these D1 conferences don't start trying to affect this sport because kids that started young because of wrestling are having the ability to go to Cornell and go to, uh, you know, Princeton's and, and, and do what they're doing. And uh, so keep doing what you're doing. Keep growing the sport. I appreciate you guys. And uh, this is what our sport produces, guys like this. So let's keep fighting for it. Of course. Thank you for having us and thank you for growing the sport using this platform. Appreciate it. Facebook. You guys take care. Thank you so much. Take care.